Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ben Follett. I'm the U.S. Product and Marketing Manager for SIA in the United States. And today's webinar is titled Linking Structural Analysis to Design and, Re and Design to Revit. Uh, we're going to focus today on the interoperability between SIA Engineer and Revit and uh, going in both directions. Uh, before we do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you are eligible to receive a PDH for attending the majority of today's webinar. Um, I will be sending those out in the next uh, few days. Additionally, if you have any questions, we'll be taking some questions at the end. There is a questions panel uh, that you can go ahead and uh, ask a question in there, and then we'll go ahead and answer them at the end when we have some time. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So before uh, we start, I want to talk a little bit about Nemencheck uh, as a group. So Nemencheck uh, really is one large group of AEC software companies that uh, shares a strong vision of really providing software for um, the industry to be in order to just become uh, more efficient and and really to promote interoperability. And so you can see all the different brands within the Nemencheck group here. Um, in the United States, we're certainly known for um, our brands like SIA, SDS2, Bluebeam, um, some of our architectural brands like Vectorworks and Graphisoft. And then recently, just uh, a few weeks ago, um, we uh, welcomed Risa Technologies uh, to the Nemencheck Group. And so we're really uh, excited about uh, the partnerships that Risa and SIA and other softwares in the U.S. are going are gonna to have, and, and we look forward to working together with them. But today, we want to really focus on uh, SIA Engineer. So SIA Engineer is part of a new breed of integrated three-dimensional finite element analysis program. Um, and while it may be a new... Uh, software new name to you. Uh, it's certainly not uh, a new software. Uh, we have a long development history. We've been around for just over 45 years uh, developing the product by, uh, primarily for that amount of time in Europe. Um, but we really think it has some really nice benefits, especially uh, for this Revit inter exchange and interoperability story. And so really more and more structural engineers are being asked to participate in these collaborative model-based interoperability workflows. However, what we find out is that Plugging into these 3D processes can be different, difficult with maybe traditional engineering software or, or a software that's mainly based in, in two dimensions rather than three dimensions. And so with that in mind, really the goal of today's presentation is to discuss the various interoperability workflow options that exist within C Engineer and then how each of these workflows offer benefits and flexibility when exchanging structural analysis data between Revit and, and a design software like SIA. And so the first workflow that we want to explore will be a, a really a direct exchange analytical model workflow. Uh, for this development, uh, our analytical link is actually developed through a strategic partnership uh, with Autodesk through the authorized developer CADS based out of the UK. So CADS is a, a developer that works um, with us, but also is a reseller of C Engineer in the UK. And so um, really has a good understanding of both SIA and, and Autodesk products like Revit. So they really provided a lot of value for us. And so really the question we always get is, well, this analytical model, what does it support? And so this is just a, a kind of a brief list of some of the things that are supported bidirectionally between the link between SIA and Autodesk Revit. So geometry, uh, different material types, supports, end restraints and hinges, loads and load combinations. Um, you can do entire models or parts of models. There's also some change management and tracking in there. And additionally, you can do analytical results, whether it's reactions, moments. You can put those in beam annotations, and we'll look at that a little bit later. And so many customers who are using Revit, um, but they really don't know or understand the analytical model that Revit has. So in short, all structural model objects within Revit have an associated analytical model. So as long as the enable analytical model checkbox is active, um, this analytical model exists. And so this analytical line uh, that you see here uh, may need to be adjusted before an exchange between Revit and analysis software occurs. So for this purpose, Revit has some very basic analytical model tools um, that can be used to allow the user to adjust various properties of the analytical model, including 1D member end extensions, openings, and analytical line uh, alignments. Now that we understand that the analytical model is um, you know, not necessarily something that everybody pays attention to, but let's go ahead and with that information, take a look at how this data can be transferred using this analytical link um, from Revit to SIA. And so here we just have a, a brief uh, model of some different uh, types of geometry that we want to be able to transfer. So steel, concrete, different geometry, different slopes, all of this is going to be transferred based on this analytical geometry that's in the background. And so again, this is because that enable analytical line is um, enabled. 
Now we can adjust these analytical lines in Revit like I mentioned, um, but a lot of this adjustment may be easier to do in your finite element analysis software. Now when we're ready to um, transfer, we can add or click on the CADS link, which is where our transfer tools exist. And we can go ahead and begin to make the transfer. The first you can see is we have some PDFs that are pre-installed. So getting started, best practices, a help file, all that you can just access. When we click the options, we can see the options that are available for transfer. We can choose from different codes. We can choose the mapping tables in which we want to use. So you know the imperial mapping tables in this particular case are of top priority for me. We can choose mapping rules and, and map our own families if we want to. Additionally, if there's objects that the mapping tables don't have, we'll always be asked to map those on our own, and then we can add those to the user table, and then you know, C will just recognize those each and every time. When we're ready, we can go ahead and click Export. Now I'm going to save an R2S file, so this is a Revit to SIA file. We're going to export that file so that we can then import it directly into SIA. And this gives us a, a, a data, or this gives us kind of a, a record of the exchange. And so once we click Close here, I can go ahead and navigate to SIA. I'm going to choose File and Import, and obviously we'll choose Revit file in this case. We'll navigate to that location on the desktop and find that R2S file. We'll just make sure the codes are matching, and we'll go ahead and import this particular file. So you can see here this transfer was really done based on that analytical model. So we have this kind of one-to-one -one transfer based on that analytical model. Um, so all the walls, all the 1D members, all the materials, this is all brought in. We can see the, the rendering of these particular objects. Now ultimately, if we want to go ahead and make some changes, this is kind of that round tripping, we can go ahead and do that and then send that information back to Revit. And so I'll just change some geometry. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add in like... Uh, like an opening here, so we'll add an opening to this uh, this concrete slab. We can really add any type of opening. I'll just go ahead and sketch uh, one here of kind of some polygon. And then we'll go ahead and um, maybe add some additional data. So I'll just take this frame and we'll go ahead and copy it um, so we have some new objects when we do the import. So we've changed some objects, we've added some openings, we've added some additional uh, different, different members. And so we're ready to make the exchange back to Revit. What we'll do in this case is we'll choose File, Export, and we'll export the Revit file. Now in this particular case, I'm going to save over that existing file so that we can keep that reference. And then we can navigate back into Autodesk Revit. Now when we're ready to update the changes, we have a few options for import, but I'm going to choose to use the Review and Import. We really want to uh, utilize that change management. And so if I choose to Review and Import the Link Supported Items file, We'll get this view of you know, what has been added or what's been changed or if there's new objects. So you can see cross-section changes, new objects. We've added an opening. You can see that. We can choose what we want to import or what changes we want to get rid of, or we can just choose to import everything. In this case, that's what I'll do. And so it's just going to import all of these members. And so one, one thing it's doing is it's going to, going to evaluate everything in there just to make sure if there's any particular changes, if the members rotated or if the materials changed. And then it'll go ahead and add all the new members that we're adding. So in this case, we've finished the transfer. And we can go ahead and see those changes reflected back in this Revit model. So we can see the adjustment of uh, the geometry that we did in this frame, the duplication of that um, other frame, and then finally the added opening. And all of this, again, was based on that analytical model. And so you can see here the changes in those analytical models um, are, exact, are those exact changes that we had before. Now, in addition, it's also possible to send analytical model results and other information from C Engineer back to Revit once the design is complete. And so it's not just geometry or changes in geometry. We also want to send data that happens in the design so you can do that documentation or that annotation in the Revit model. And so in this case, uh, I've already created a model we finished. I'm going to go ahead and import. Now, instead of importing using an R2S file, I'm going to actually import directly from an open SIA file. And so I've just initiated the import. You can see I've chosen to import analysis results and load combinations. And then we're going to just build this brand new model. And so we'll get all the columns and the frames, um, the diagonal braces, and then we'll have all this information in that we can go ahead and um, look at what we can do once we have more detailed information than just the geometry. And so when the model has completed, 
we can go ahead and add, you can see if we have some things that maybe we didn't reference or there wasn't a specific match code to code, we can go ahead and pick in that particular case a metal deck that we wanted to choose. Now we can see the analytical model, we can see the supports and the different beams and columns. We can go ahead and create new plan views. So I'm going to create plan views for both my stories here. <coughs> and then let's first go look at the floor. So if we look at the floor, we want to next add our beam annotations. And so if we choose beam annotations, we can choose to bring in the start forces, the end forces, and also in this particular case, the structural framing tags for composite design. And so in this case, we see the composite design, the number of studs, as well as the camber. Additionally, if we want to go ahead and look at the beam annotations for the roof, I'll disable the forces in this particular case and change the framing tag to just the framing tag for the roof. And so we can see the different joist information that was brought in. Also, if I select a few of these joists, we can see some different information. So here we got we have some comments based on the girder, so the spacing. We have some additional comments because uh, Revit doesn't have any KCS series joists, but SIA can design those, or special joists, but SIA can design those as well. And so we've brought that additional information into the comments of each individual member. So you, the, the engineer, can do a final kind of assessment of what you want. Additionally, one thing nice about SIA is we can go ahead and select the uh, slab, and we can see that it's actually a 5-inch concrete slab with a composite deck, a Volcraft composite deck. And on the roof here, we've got this 1.5-inch Can-Am deck. And so we're also transferring not only joists and joist girders and composite beams and all the information that go along with those, but also the deck uh, profiles based on the catalogs that exist both in Revit and C Engineer. Now, one of the things that's always a major issue um, is with the transfer of the model information to an analysis software, and then we really just have issues with um, alignment. So, you know, maybe the model wasn't created exactly the way the you know to connected in Revit, and so the question is, what do we do? You know, so everything looks great in C or in the Revit model, but when we transfer it, we're going to get those problems, those issues in SIA. And because those issues exist, we're going to have issues with connectivity. And so in this case, I'm just going to export everything. We're going to export this building model. Um, we'll do a few uh, things of mapping uh, during the process. And then when we get into SIA, um, we're going to use some of SIA's BIM toolbox tools, some of its alignment tools, to really um, do the alignment where it's needed. You know, we really don't need the alignment in the Revit model because you're just using that for the creation of drawings. Um, but you do need it in the analysis model because if things aren't connected properly, then the model's not going to run. You're not going to get proper load transfer. You're not going to get a proper analysis. And so we're going to import this R2S file. And if we go ahead and look, we can see the issues that we're having, the same issues that we had in the Revit model, that things aren't connected properly. So we've got all these different nodes. And really, we want one node at this particular location. And so instead of doing this manually, we're going to go ahead and use our BIM toolbox. And so in, our BIM, in the BIM toolbox, I'm going to go ahead and access the Align tool. So when I double click on Align to open it up, we ask if we want to proceed with all ent entries. In this case, we do. We can go ahead and enable the planes and the preview of which we want to actually um, do the alignment. So I'll, I'll turn on the preview here. And then I'll go ahead and enable different planes. And so I have you know, the one, all planes for 1D members, all planes for 2D members, and we want to extend those 2D member planes. So basically, all these major planes are the planes that we're going to use for alignment. We can also turn on and off some different features, like whether or not we want the openings to adjust and change, or do we want them to keep their original shape. Now, once we have these different planes enabled, we can actually go ahead and look in the alignment info at the master planes we can see the individual planes that are going to be used. And so in this case, we can see all the 1D member planes that would be used for alignment. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and, and eliminate the mapping or the, the alignment to the horizontal planes, uh, or the, excuse me, the diagonal planes in the members. So really, we just have this orthogonal layout of alignment. Now, if we had grid lines, we could also um, align to grid lines. In this case, we're just going to align uh, to our column and beam lines. And so when we're ready, we'll click Run Align. And then if we zoom back into um, that location that we had before where we had some issues, we can see now that the entirety of that is localized now at one particular node. And so we don't have issues anymore with that. We've, got, we've eliminated all those additional nodes. We've kind of cured that alignment issue because of the alignment, the alignment planes that we used.
Now at this point, it's very easy to just take the next step and run our connectivity so we can go ahead and generate all the connections that we would need for the finite element analysis, including the connection of 1D members to the plates as ribs, so basically these com this composite connection. And now we're ready to just continue to go on and do an analysis, add supports, do design, etc. Now, since most companies that we meet are not using the analytical model in Revit, a separate workflow which allows for the exchange of structural model information uh, really is required. Um, this structural model information can be exchanged using IFC. So for those that don't know, IFC is a vendor-neutral BIM file format which utilizes object-based data models for the exchange of information. So these object-based reference files can be imported into structural analysis software where they, where they can be used to directly or indirectly create an analysis model. And so this workflow really offers um, some nice flexibility over the analytical model workflow because uh, the types of objects that can be exchanged are not tied to a predefined set of mapping tables. It's not defined by an API that says, okay, if, if, if one software doesn't accept the exchange, then, it, then it's not going to work. So if there's always limitations to um, exchanges that are built directly in a, in a software. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at how this process would work using IFC and C Engineer. So another video here, I'm going to go ahead and import an IFC file. This is actually going to be a parking garage file, so we'll switch. We've done some steel buildings. We're going to go ahead and look at a, a concrete parking garage. Um, and so if we import this IFC file, we have some import options, whether we want to use uh, as reference models, kind of how this geometry wants to come in, what items that we want to ignore, or so on and so forth. And so now that we have those that information, we can go ahead and begin to utilize the BIM toolbox to convert the geometry directly into native SIA objects. And so I'm going to go ahead and change the rendering to transparent just so we can see things a little bit better. And I'm going to go into the BIM toolbox. And so instead of using that align command, I'm going to use the conversion command this time. So first I'm going to choose to convert some general solid elements, these IFC objects, into beams and columns or basically 1D members. So I'll choose to convert one beam and it determines that it's a 24 by 24 rectangular column. Now I can do the same thing to all the columns. I can just select that I want to find all the columns, all the elements that have the role column, and I want to convert those directly into vertical 24 by 24 1D objects. Additionally, we can also convert any of the wall elements or slab elements. And so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and select one of these interior shear wall elements. And again, I'm going to find all of the wall elements at this point. So I'm going to choose any, everything internally and externally. And instead of using the general solid into beam and column function, I'll use it into general solid into plate or wall function. And so we can generate these plate objects. And so you can see that we can really use that information to be able to create an IFC model, or excuse me, create a native SIA model directly from IFC. Now the other workflow that's possible is maybe you don't want to utilize the geometry to, uh, you don't want to utilize the geometry in the creation of the model, but you want to use, oops, you want to utilize the geometry to make a, um, you know, to, to kind of have as reference geometry. And so in this particular case, um, I've got this blue geometry that is the architectural model that we brought in. And so you can see how the architectural model was used to create the structural model. Now, in some cases, the objects were converted, like we saw before. In some cases, they were just drawn using the snap points uh, of the architectural model. Now, in addition, you, this isn't just limited to architectural information. I can also bring in, for instance, uh, HVAC data. And so if we go ahead and turn on a clipping box here, we can see the HVAC model in orange brought into this uh, structural model in this kind of center core. And so in this case, we're not converting any of the ductwork or any of the machines to native SIA geometry, but what we can do is we can utilize this data to see exactly where we need to put penetrations in the shear walls, where we need to hang ductwork, and where we need to add loads from the roof uh, system, or even where we need to add additional loads for mechanical rooms. And obviously, if these change, we can update the IFC model based on a new IFC model that we receive from a mechanical contractor. The last part about this that's really great is that you can incorporate all of these models together. And so because SIA has the ability to utilize layers, we can have a structural model layer, 
uh, a, an architectural model layer, an HVAC model layer, a site model layer, whatever, we can bring in these additional model layers and use them and update them as we need to be able to build um, the model based on that reference geometry. So to keep our, really, and it's, a, it's really a coordination issue. It's being able to keep and coordinate our, um, our structural model with whatever's changing uh, from all the other disciplines um, in a fashion that isn't just getting a red marked, uh, you know, 2D uh, PDF or, or, or drawing and then having to exchange those or put those uh, updates into your model. And so in this case, just got a few shots. This is actually the architectural model of that same building. You know, we can see how the architecture, you know, the glass facade we can see is working with the structure. And then in a similar fashion, how the facade is working with the, um, is working with the mechanical system. And so all of this being in one model allows you to, uh, and really having this in a model inside of your analysis software, inside of your structural analysis software, maybe allows you a lot of advantages when you're trying to do some coordination. Now one of the great things about this reference model workflow is that it gives you interoperability which goes beyond even just Revit. Um, so through the Open BIM initiative, model exchange is possible with over 150 BIM offering tools including Revit, Vectorworks, Tecla, SDS2, Archicad, and others. And so these are just a, a, li a few uh, softwares that all support this Open BIM uh, project. In addition, the associations uh, for the different materials are really starting to actively support the Open BIM initiative through their own interoperability studies. And so if we start with AISC, they have more recently established a strategy um, for short, medium, and long-term interoperability with a focus on working with Building Smart and promoting IFC. So essentially kind of deprecating their SIS2 file format and really uh, buying into and utilizing IFC as their main uh, transfer format that they support. The same thing goes with um, concrete, and so we have a, a similar concrete committee, uh, really with the goal of starting to write specifications and to investigate how to promote and use IFC. We find the same thing um, within the precast concrete community, um, and so we, Nemencheck, the company Nemencheck, really uh, was involved with Building Smart um, and participated with a number of softwares to really investigate this workflow based on these new PCI standards. And then finally, we see this at the government level too. Um, this is just an example, but um, we see this happening internationally in the sense that the UK government and many of the other governments, uh, including our own, are starting to actively create BIM initiatives, really that we want to create more efficient uh, construction processes through the use of BIM. Now, as we've seen both workflows, we've seen a workflow with the analytical model, we've seen a workflow with the reference model, you know, there really is this sweet spot where we, where, where we can use the advantages of both, right? So there's really a lot of nice advantages for both, and so we can use those together um, in a software like C Engineer. And so typically, though, we find that a lot of other softwares have you know, really just one option. You have an analytical link and you can't support IFC or you have a, you can do IFC but you don't have an analytical model link. So really that's what's great about the interoperability with C Engineer. We understand that no project, um, no two projects may be the same and so maybe the, the requirements or the interoperability requirements or who you're working with, what software your architects are using or what software your other um, disciplines are using may really dictate how you can exchange model information. And so being able to be flexible and use both the analytical and reference model geometry um, can offer great advantages. And so just kind of a workflow that we actually worked up for a client. So we've got this structure that is kind of an office structure, so a, a building structure, and then it's got a um, kind of a warehouse area that's connected by this um, this kind of covered walkway. And so in this case, there's a lot of data that's ex that can be exchanged directly via the link. But there is some data that um, may create some issues in the link. And so let's look at some of these. So these modeling nuances. So the first is these columns with corbels. So these corbels, you can see the analytical line there in Revit. These corbels aren't referenced in that analytical line at all. And so if we were to transfer that column, we'd lose that corbel. Um, in addition, the precast double T's, you can see the analytical line running through the middle of that precast double T there on the roof. Again, it has no reference to that opening. Now, that opening is important for reinforcement detailing, maybe for concentration of stresses. And so, really, if you just import that via the analytical link, you're going to lose that data in your model. And so, you know, relying on solely on the link may give you or may lead to simplifying assumptions that you're not willing to um, 
not willing to have when you're doing an analysis. And so we can really do a two-stage export then. So the first is an export of the items that are supported and uh, are represented really the exact right way that the engineer wants them through that transfer using the analytical link. And so in this case, we see most of the steel and the concrete, um, some of the precast elements, so these inverted precast double Ts, uh, or excuse me, the inverted precast Ts and the L shapes, um, all the concrete walls, the slabs, the, the, the shear walls in, in the building, all this stuff can be transferred via the link. The other information that's not, we're going to choose to transfer via IFC. So some of the foundation elements, uh, those columns with corbels, and then the precast double Ts that have openings. We can choose to then do what we want with them once we get them in the analytical model software. And so the idea here is we can create a combined model. So the way this works is we'd import the beginning of the model using the direct link, and then instead of re-importing the IFC model, we would choose to file update the model. And so we can then add on the IFC information to this already existing model that was used via the link. And then use, using some of those analytical uh, BIM toolbox tools that we saw, we can go ahead and then convert geometry like the, the, the columns with corbels or the precast double Ts or even the, uh, the foundation elements. We can create and convert those directly into native C objects as we so choose. Um, and so we can then, really given the flexibility to make the decision of how we want those objects to be represented, not by the link, but by the engineer in the engineering software. And then finally, when we need to do final coordination, we can send this to um, a software like Celebri Model Checker or Tecla BIM Site, where we can do some va validation and variation and go ahead and get, uh, exchange this with more people um, during the CA phase of the project. Now we've seen advantages with both workflows, um, you know, and they really do have their advantages and disadvantages. However, you know, other software, the analytic, um, and other software, you know, we have these um, different options for more advanced, more robust interoperability. And so what we find there is the use of what we call graphical scripting. And so we're exchanging graphical scripting models through an interface to create the analytical model in a software like SIA. And so in that graphical scripting model, um, really this is visual programming used to quickly create and edit complex 3D geometry and information. Um, it's used to automate routine tasks within an application or really kind of create this kind of middleware to link various softwares in order to integrate workflows. And so where we see this used most is uh, in Vectorworks uh, through, uh, and this is kind of the top picture here, uh, Vectorworks through what's uh, a software called or a, a, a plugin within the software called Marionette or primarily what we see it in our industry is through um, Rhino and its use of Grasshopper and so with that you know Grasshopper really is used to create efficient design iterations through the use of parametric design and optimization techniques so this particular uh, these particular pictures are actually um, their roof uh, tests kind of roof um, uh, iterations, design iterations uh, that were done for a stadium by AECOM. And so AECOM does this really to quickly evaluate the feasibility of specific roof configurations for, for stadiums or other projects. And so these other there are other parametric studies that uh, can be done including you know, truss optimization, even topological optimization, all that is possible when you can script that um, within the, gri the, the Rhino Grasshopper interface and then exchange that with C Engineer. So let's kind of take a look at uh, what this looks like in real time. And so here I've got a model, it's in Grasshopper. You can see these sliders that we've created, that are created in this graph, Grasshopper script that change the model, um, you know, dynamically in Grasshopper. When we're ready, we can go ahead and, and send an XML file. So this is the SIA data file. We'll send an XML file that we can be, that we can then import into C Engineer. And so once that model is imported into C Engineer, we can do all the things that we need to do in the structural analysis software, right? So we can go ahead and quickly add supports. We can go ahead and quickly add load cases and load combinations and, and other loads that we want to then apply to the structure. And so we're doing this so that we can send this in, you know, so we can quickly do design iterations of this maybe complex geometry. So we'll go ahead and add some point forces uh, to the truss system. And then we'll go ahead and 
close this out, we'll go ahead and look at combinations. We'll just create a few combinations based on these two load cases, and then finally go ahead and run a calculation. And so once we run the calculation, we get our results. We can go ahead and look at displacements in this. So we'll just go ahead and look at the deformed structure. One of the things people always like to see is the animation of this deformed structure, so we can go ahead and animate that deformed structure. And then finally, we can go ahead and look at you know steel check results. So if we want to take this information and then give us the unity check on the members, we can do that and then finally take this to optimization. Now again, then this can be exchanged back because this information was brought in via XML. It can be exchanged back to Rhino or Grasshopper via, via XML so that you can then do some documentation. Whether you're exchanging that information or bringing that information then into Revit through maybe Dynamo or, or through some other methodology, um, you can use all the tools together that um, are really used for their specific purpose. CIA for structural analysis and design, Grasshopper and Rhino for kind of this generative parametric-based optimization and modeling and model creation and, and design iteration, and then finally Revit for its final documentation. Now there are some free resources if you're not maybe very familiar with graphical scripting. Uh, the first is uh, Panda Light. So Panda Light is actually uh, was created and written by AECOM to transfer data between Rhino and C Engineer. Um, so the Panda Link is what they use all the time to create these models. So they've actually created a, a light version of this to to do that so that you could try it out and do for free. Um, Geometry Gym. Geometry Gym is um, a company that creates Grasshopper and IFC plugins for many softwares, including C Engineer. Um, Case is a BIM consultant creating graphical scripting workflows for engineering firms. And also at the Proving Ground, Nathan Miller does the same thing, kind of creates um, interoperability tools for the, for the engineering space, specifically focused on IFC and, and some of these more um, robust graphical scripting uh, workflows. And so let's take a moment to kind of recap uh, what we've looked at and what we've talked about. And so the first is really the advantages and, and what's happening with the analytical model exchange. So that first is um, really the pros of this and really what we see is probably the, the widest use uh, is this analytical model exchange. So it supports direct data transfer between softwares based on member mapping. So you're always going to get a one-to-one -one transfer. A, wide, a certain wide flange in Revit is always going to be a certain wide flange in SIA or, or, or whatever software you're using. Typically the link is, is bi-directional. There's some limitations to that based on the type of link or, or the, the manufacturer of the link, but really these changes can be pushed in either direction. You really don't have any limitations based on um, what's getting pushed. Um, and then they're also expandable. So um, you can, since a lot of this is based on mapping tables, you can include um, custom families or custom objects because it's based on just kind of a text-based data table in the background. Some of the cons are, you know, if you don't have an analytical model or you're not managing an analytical model uh, in Revit, you're not going to get a transfer. Additionally, in, in that sense, that unmanaged analytical model can lead to alignment and connectivity issues. We saw that with the connectivity of, of that model. And, having to use the alignment commands in C Engineer. And that's probably the biggest issue that we see with people is that they struggle with the alignment because their analytical models are not created appropriately in, in Revit. Or they don't want to take the time to manage those analytical models. And then finally, there are always going to be cross-section types that are not in the library that don't transfer. Maybe they're cellular beams, maybe in this case, you know, for C, they're three plate members. Whatever the members are, you know, there's always going to be some limitations because it's not a completely open source um, you know, system. We also spoke about um, IFC interoperability um, through this kind of reference model based workflow. So really in this case, there's no limit to geometry that can be exchanged. You can do tapered members and shells and more complex geometry. Um, so that open file format also not only allows you a lot of geometry, but it also allows you to exchange data with um, any number of BIM applications. So in this case, you know, we talked about 150. So all those BIM applications that participate in this kind of building smart open BIM workflow, you know, you can exchange that data. The biggest for me is the ability to exchange non-analytical model data. So that architecture, that MEP, that civil, being able to put that on a layer, being able to have that kind of in the background for reference, being able to use that information to know where you have to cut a hole in a wall or a hole in a slab or where you have to add line loads or point loads in a roof or on a floor because you're hanging ductwork. That really, I think, can save a lot of time instead of having to try to coordinate that in, in 2D drawings. 
Some of the cons, no mapping tables, um, so there's no direct mapping of elements. You're always going to have alignment and connectivity issues because there is no analytical model in this case. Um, and then you're always going to have to convert that general geometry uh, using something like the BIM toolbox and SIA to real objects that you can use. And so there's a few more steps involved, um, and, and that's what happens when it's a more open format. Finally, we have um, workflow interoperability through graphical scripting. And so this isn't, I know, you know, we really understand this isn't for everybody. It's not something maybe that you're going to do on a really complex project, uh, but it is does give you the ability to quickly create and edit complex 3D geometries, whether it's a truss or a complex roof like we saw on AECOM, or even if it's just something that you can create quick automation with parametrics, or you can create something that you're going to do over and over and over again. Um, there can be some real advantages to doing that. Obviously, there's a bi-directional link exchange using XML, and so being able to accept and import and export XML for SIA and, and other softwares is, is valuable. It does require some computer programming experience, so you do have some limitations in the sense that um, if you don't know anything about Grasshopper, you don't know how to create the Grasshopper model or, or exchange those nodes or do some other things, you know, you're going to be limited in what you can do. Um, and it really, like I mentioned, it's not practical for um, typical structures. Now, with all that in mind, you know, uh, the question I get the most is, well, who's using this? You know, are, are people actually using these workflow uh, procedures to create real work, create things that are out there, or are people just struggling, you know, to, to do certain things? And so um, people are really doing this. Um, you know, these are all user contest projects. So we have a user contest every two years where people submit their exciting and outstanding projects to be voted on and then there's a winner in, in a few different categories and so in this particular case um, this company with this project in China actually um, first took to um, building the model in Revit based on a SketchUp model and then sent that model information to C Engineer and so that's kind of a you know they created the model in SketchUp built the model in Revit had the analytical model in Revit and then exchanged that with C Engineer and so you know to them this proved to be a, a very reliable workflow now we also see this, this is uh, Riverstone Structural Concepts, actually a company uh, out of Idaho um, doing uh, interoperability using IFC. And so in this case, they weren't using Revit. They, they had an architect that, were, that wasn't or that was using Revit, but they in their office was using Archicad. And so the architectural models were given to them via IFC from Revit. They brought those in to their Archicad in IFC were able to kind of create their own structural stuff. Then the Archicad file was exported via IFC to SIA and they were able to create the overall model. They were able to create the information and then you know, do the analysis, do the design that they needed to do. In addition, um, we also see the, um, this is a, a new user project, but this is kind of on the stadium side. This is kind of a combination of the two. So um, using X, X, the XML API in SIA, um, they could, do an exchange using that graphical scripting workflow. So we're sending some design iterations between, um, you know, Grasshopper where maybe things are starting and, and the architect is even working in Rhino, and then being able to change that and, and work in close collaboration to be able to get really settle on that design soon. And then once that design was done and in SIA, then it could be done for structural analysis. And then finally, we can send that model backstream to Revit for final documentation, right? And so you have this documentation. So you have this workflow which is incorporating more than one um, workflow procedure, whether it's the analytical model and the reference model, or it's using uh, Grasshopper and Revit together and the Revit analytical link, really to be able to, again, utilize the different exchange methodologies for where they are going to be most beneficial in your workflow. So whether that's uh, using the analytical model to create final documentation in Revit, using you know, the reference model to bring in, you know, non-analytical geometry like MEP or, or whatever to be able to create that information in your SIA model or using Grasshopper. Be, the ability to use all three is, is really uh, a big advantage in the software. And so with that, I want to open up um, our time to some questions. We've got some questions pouring in, which is great. And so we want to take some time to answer some questions. Um, so right now, there was the, the first question was about some of the other objects maybe that we didn't touch on today that you can send between uh, Revit and SIA. Um, and so right now, there was so right now this the link does not support um, 
masonry uh, or it does support wood, um, doesn't support masonry, and it does support uh, some cold form sections as well, but not masonry right now. Um, so let's see what else we hear. Um, So let's see, we had a question about um, the ability to uh, utilize complex models. Um, so we have, you know, obviously all of the models here that we used um, are relatively, you know, um, you know simple. Um, you know, and really the, the examples that we used here are to show kind of larger workflows. One of the, the big comments that, that we hear from um, links in general is the fact that um, you know, well, we see very limited data which can exchange, you know, a, a simple beam, a simple column, a, a simple 2D member, but that's not indicative of what my model ever looks like, right? It's my model's always more complex, and as soon as I add those complexities, you know, the, the links start to break down. And so really what I tried, what I want to show and what we typically try to demo when we demo this functionality between Revit and C Engineer is real projects that real people are doing that um, can really prove out the workflow so that you feel confident when you buy SIA or when you when you subscribe to this this workflow that you're going to get what it, what we say you're going to get. You're not just going to you're not going to have to try to scale this up and then find oh well it works for one or two beams but it doesn't work for a building like this structure we see on our screen. Um, okay, we have um, some questions about IFC. Um, so we yeah so. Um, if you're exporting from IFC um, in Revit, um, you know, really there's some options. I would recommend there's a, an Autodesk Revit uh, application, kind of a plugin that you can download. It's for free. It's created by Autodesk, and it's specifically to make their IFC exchange more robust. It gives you some more options, and those options allow you to do more things that allow it to better be better transferred to a software like C Engineer um, or any of the kind of structural softwares. And so... Um, I would just visit, yeah, I would search Autodesk apps and then you can, you know, sign in with your Google account or something and you can download that IFC plugin based on uh, the version of Revit that you're using. I think I've seen ones from 2015 up to 2018 now. Um, and so, you know, that's really uh, pretty simple. Um, we can certainly, uh, I have no problem sending you guys, whoever wants the, the presentation, I have no problem sending the, the presentation um, or the IFC models so that people can kind of take a look at them for themselves. Or if somebody's interested, we can obviously do further demos um, about um, this particular workflow and, and, and kind of how this works maybe for your particular office or, or how you're doing it. Um, we got a question about centerline-based models. In um, and I'm not sure if this was meant in Revit or this was meant in IFC. So obviously that analytical line is quote unquote that center line. So typical analysis software, the analytical line is at the center line, and see that analytical line doesn't have to be at the center line. It can be at the top of the beam, the bottom of the beam, the left of the beam, the right of the beam. And so when you transfer that data from the analytical model in Revit, that data is always maintained. Um, when you're doing IFC. Because IFC is not an analytical model, it's a general, it's kind of a general reference model workflow, that data does not exist until we do that conversion. So when we do that conversion using the BIM toolbox, like we showed in the precast model, that analytical center line or analytical line will then be generated. And so that gets generated through that analytical um, BIM toolbox and that um, conversion tool. Um, so there's some questions about uh, using Grasshopper and um, uh, you know plugins like Dynamo for 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 Rhino or excuse me for for Revit. Um, you know really the 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 support there. You know obviously I'm not a Rhino expert. I'm not a Grasshopper expert, nor am I a Dynamo expert. Um, but I know that a lot of those softwares have very robust. Um, you know, tutorials and, and tips and tricks on how to build, you know, individual nodes and how to set that up. And really, um, once you get to the point where you have that set up, we have some information and some um, data on how to build the export. So how to create the XML file such that it can get read into SIA properly. So we just have a data structure that you can subscribe to and, and just plug into. And then that can be transferred to the XML appropriately in SIA. And then that can be read and brought into SIA. Uh, additionally, you know, not everybody is comfortable with building 
the nodes and the grasshopper stuff on their own. So that's why um, that's why these that the link that I showed is actually something that was already pre-built. So that's built by someone. He he you know creates model exchanges and and basically middleware software so that people don't have to build it on their own. And so you can exchange directly from Rhino using Grasshopper or using I uh, and using XML or using IFC via some of those links created uh, through Geometry Gym. And so you can visit that website geometrygym.com and, and download his stuff. He's got links for all kinds of uh, different software, no matter what you use, whether it's SIA or or eTabs or or whatever else. You they, he's got different links for it. Um, let's see, um, what other kind of what other kind of questions do we have? Um, I think, uh, let's see, oh, somebody brought up a question about uh, a tryout. Um, you know, SIA does offer, uh, SIA does offer a tryout, and so uh, if you're interested uh, in a tryout, you know, we, we will give you a full 30-day tryout of the software. That's not a problem at all. Um, it's a full version of the software. There's no limitations. There's just a watermark on the, um, just a watermark on the, uh, on the output so that you can't produce real, um, you know, real work with those, but um, you can just go to sia.net um, and on the on the homepage there'll be a uh, um, there'll be a uh, a link where you can just click to uh, get your free tryout, um, and then during that free tryout we're, we're happy to send you a bunch of different tutorials and then support you during that tryout so that you can um, really give SIA you know a fair shake. Really, you can get into the the tryout and really try to understand if SIA is something that can help you or not, and and especially if this Revit transfer is is of of interest, you know, we can we can do that as well. Um, so there were there are some questions about um, you know just kind of the analysis and design. So SIA is a full 3D finite element analysis and design package. So it does design gravity lateral systems. Um, we do connection design through our links with SDS2, which is a fully robust Nemechek product. They do um, really great connection design, not verification. Um, and so, uh, you know, and, and then that helps to exchange model information to detailing. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, and then obviously we can, we support all different types of materials. You know, you saw a variety of different materials today in the exchanges, um, whether they're concrete or steel or cold form or shear walls. Um, you know, or foundations, all that information is, uh, or all the, that, that type, those types of elements are supported um, for modeling analysis and design um, in the software. And so, um, really, if you have more specific questions about uh, the technical functionality of the software, um, you know, I'd be happy to set up a, um, a technical demonstration where we can, we can go ahead and, uh, and look at those things in detail. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? Um, uh, somebody asked about, um, you had mentioned the analytical um, adjustments that exist in Revit, just kind of, you know, are, you know if, if we've ever used those or ever have used those. So it's my opinion that um, the analytical adjustments that exist in Revit, um, there's some uh, wall adjustments and let's see, I can, I can probably go back to that slide so we can see it. There's some wall adjustments and um, uh, you know, analytical you know, node adjustments and whatnot. Um, the wall adjustments, I think, work work really pretty well in uh, in Revit. Here we go. And so, being able to kind of match the ends of a wall to another end of a wall that works pretty well. The sizing of openings works pretty well. Trying to grab the ends of nodes so that they connect from a column to a beam or a, from a, for two beams to a column it really is is difficult in 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 Revit, in my opinion. Um, I think it's much easier to either use the analytical alignment tools that exist in SIA or to just even it's much easier to just grab the node in SIA because you have that real a real analytical model and a real analytical line and that's the basis of your model in an analysis software and drag that or or select that node and, and move this node coordinates uh, appropriately uh, just by you know typing it into a table or something like that and so that may be much easier in um, in the software um, in, in the software like SIA than it would be um, in uh, you know your analytical model. Let's see. Any other questions? Um, there was a final question about another question about IFC. So yes, again, IFC is supported. Um, 
you know, not only by Revit, but by other architectural packages. Um, like I mentioned, um, Archicad, um, which is, you know, one of our users was using Archicad and they, you know, use this transfer or um, we exchange IFC data with Tecla or SDS2. Um, that's how we exchange data directly with SDS2 right now is, is through that IFC model and that then gets read as a native Tecla model, or excuse me, a native SDS2 model in SDS2. Um, so it's a really robust workflow, uh, one that I think is probably a bit more popular in Europe, this kind of open BIM, you know, uh, workflow. Um, but one that we're certainly seeing become more and more popular as, as maybe people are using um, other, or finding architects are using other softwares to do their documentation maybe other than Revit. Um, and so that's why we, we like to, you know, at least bring up that other option to give you um, the flexibility that you may need to do something in another project. Okay, um, well, if there are no other questions, let me get to the last slide here. Um, you know, if there are no other questions, certainly we thank you for your um, participation. Um, like I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, we'll be sending out uh, certificates um, probably, you know, uh, towards the end of this week um, or early um, or the early tomorrow or, or to the end of this week once we get that all processed and, and, the, and the information gets to us from GoToMeeting. Um, if you're interested, we'll also be following up with people just to um, check to see if there's additional information that you'd like or uh, maybe additional um, information about demos or, or whatnot. We can certainly provide those. Um, obviously, if you're interested in a tryout, please visit our website, www.sia.net, for uh, a tryout, a free tryout, and we can go ahead and approve that and get you started on that. And then otherwise, um, if you missed it or if you couldn't stay for the whole thing or if there's someone else in your office that wanted to take a look at it, um, just uh, visit our YouTube page. Just search SIA on YouTube, S-C-I-A on YouTube, and uh, the recording will be up on YouTube um, probably a little bit later today, maybe um, earlier tomorrow, um, you know, by the latest. So thanks for your attendance, and uh, we hope you have a good rest of your day. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.